Many times we've been defeated. Who has not been defeated before? Life throws lots of twists around us. And every so often, God inspires us to win, to be victorious, to rise up, to overcome the battle. And the people of God, during their 30 or 35 years of bewilderness life, have been defeated many times, and they fell into so many mistakes. Today, however, is a different day. We're going to see them in the last few years as they're about to enter the promised land, Canaan, they begin to be victorious. Today is a talk about victory and not defeat. And when a believer talks about victory, one thing should come to our mind right away, victory over sin and Satan. If you are fighting, if you are struggling, if you have been a victim, a burden, or burdened by sin in your life, today will mark a different day where you think about how God deals with us as fallen people differently. In this, I want to remind people about certain promises of God to His people. This dates back to two years ago when we were studying the book of Genesis. And God spoke to Abram and told him this promise. The Lord made a covenant with Abram and he told him to your descendants. Abram at that time was not, you know, he had no children, no Isaac, no Jacob, no rest. Nothing happened yet, but God promised that he's going to give him the land of Canaan, which is Philistines, which is the Sinai, which is Israel, which is part of the Jordan, part of uh, Syria. And in verse 19 specifically says the Canaanite, the people who live there, Canaanites, Canaanites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perzites, Rephites. And here I focus verse 21 on two special people. Who are they? The Amorites, the people of Ammon, and the Canaanites, the people who lived in it. This was back in Genesis. Look at this verse. We moved to Moses. So we've fast forwarded about two years of Bible study. God says, so I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a land that's good and spacious. And God gave this beautiful description of the land of Canaan. It is the land flowing with milk and honey. Beautiful description. And he says, it is the home of these people. And again, I underline the Canaanites and the Amorites because today we're going to experience the occurrence of this promise from God that took place many, many years ago that they will win over these people. Again, in Exodus, we read the same. God is saying, I'm going to give you the land of the Canaanites, Amorites, and Perizzites. Again, God, so four times, God says, my angel will go ahead of you and I'll bring you into the land of such and such people. That is why when Moses sent the spies and they came back and they said oh the people are the land is great it's beautiful they even brought a, a big fruit remember we talked about that but they said the people mm, I don't I don't think we can do it and in that they despised God's promise in that they said to God we don't trust your promise and many times you and I do the same thing many times I do the same thing when God says I will forgive your sin. I say, I'm not sure, God, you've forgiven my sin. When God says, I will give you salvation for free, you say, are you sure? Maybe I need to do something to attain that, that salvation. When God says that I am your healer, you say, no, it is the medicine that heals or the doctor that heals. This were promises of God to his people long time ago. Today, we're going to see their occurrence. Please, when we hear today's lecture, I want you to focus on two things. Number one, where is God? Where is God in this talk today? Where is it? Where is He? I want to see Him. And number two, where are you? Or where am I? Where am I in this? Where is God? And where am I? And I promise you, if you keep those two things in your mind as I speak, God will speak to you about and reveal His glory to you and will show you yourself. Another promise. 
Because this is a Bible study, so we are studying. This is not just any sermon. It is, we are studying together the Word of God. I want people to know a little bit about the geography of the location. I want you to look at the left side. That is the Mediterranean Sea, right? This is the Middle East at the time of Moses. And at the very right bottom, you can see here the people of Moab or the land of Moab. And just on top of that, you see the land of the people of Ammon, what we call the Ammonites. And you can see here that their king had a name. Look at that kingdom of what? Sihon. Sihon, that's an important name. I'm going to throw it for you. It represents Satan. That name, that man, whenever his name comes on, is a symbol of Satan. Okay, let's move on even north of that. Another kingdom. Kingdom of, what is that? Og. O-G. Can you see that up there on the right? So these are all nations, just like, you know, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. The same thing. These are nations living here, nations living here, nation, nation. And God wants to give all this land to his people. Another map which we've seen before. This is just the route of Exodus, just to show you where we are. We are roughly around number 13 to 14. Do you see there? There, over there, over on the right top. So they, so they have passed from Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, lost in the wilderness, received the tablets, and seen the death of Moses, Miriam, and Israel. They did the, the golden calf and then went up and lost some battles and then went over to this side and last time we spoke when they were about to cross Edom remember Edom Edom we said was a red man and he represented who Esau and Edom said don't pass in my land right he told them so they had to take a detour look at the detour instead of passing look at that under that river Zared if they just cross through Edom they're already in Canaan but instead, they had to continue going at the border of Edom and going up north to these other nations. Another map, just to show you again where we are. I want you to focus here on Edom. You see Edom? There's the Edomites. That's where the problem happened. And they had to not cross through them to Canaan, but move up. So they're going to meet what nation or what people? Moab. You see that? And then after Moab, you see Ammon on top of them. Another map, again, just to show you these important four areas. Down there is Edom, and then Moab, and then Ammon, and on top of Aram, that's Israel and Philistines. This part is uh, popular. This is the center of the whole world, is on that part of the world. Jordan, uh, Syria, Iraq, Israel in today's land and Philistines. Again, here they are in today's map just to see what we're talking about this. So the same map today, this is what it looks like. By the way, do you know what that blue thing in the middle? Dead Sea. Excellent. Those of you who know geography well, this is indeed the Dead Sea. Let's, as usual, read the text and I'll just go through the important verses out of it. When the Canaanite, and now we know exactly where Canaan is, when the Canaanite king of Arad, and by the way, the meaning when you look up the word Arad, it is uh, a donkey, a wild donkey. That is the Hebrew word for wild donkey at that time was Arad. That's the meaning of that word. So that king, you can tell, he acted foolishly. When the Canaanite king of Arad, Moses, writes to us in the Negev, and that is the part of the land, he heard that Israel was coming along the road. What do you see here? He attacked the Israelites. And he captured some of them. I want to remind you how they felt that time. The people had very low self-esteem. Do you remember last Friday, the people of Israel were in a bad mood. They just lost Miriam. They lost Aaron, their high priest. They were tired from a long journey. Their brother, Edom, refused them to pass through the land. And that's why they had to take a detour. And they were tired, hungry, thirsty, and exhausted. What do you think when someone attacks them? What would they do? They would give up. 
they would just surrender. They say, fine. I actually remember last Friday that they said, oh God, I wish we were what? Dead. They were wishing to die. And so here we see an army marching against them. And actually it appears that the army started to win. And they were initially defeated. The king Arad was powerful, victorious, captured some of them. But the Bible tells us in verse 2, then the people of Israel who were again tired and exhausted and sad, they made a vow. And we talked in detail about why and when and how and if we should make vow. Vow is a contract. It's a promise. Do this and I'll do that. God says his part and we do our part. If you will deliver the people into our hands, remember they were tired, hungry, thirsty, depressed, low self-esteem. They were a weak army and the king of Canaan was powerful coming against them. But they looked to God and they said, help us. If you deliver these people in our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. That's a strange request. Like, what does that mean? Why would they totally destroy their cities? Why would they be keen on doing that? Just keep that question in mind. Let's read verse 3. It is beautiful. God listened to their prayer. My beloved, today I want to remind you that God does listen. He is not deaf. God has a title. One of his many titles, the hearer of prayers especially when they come from the heart. You think that your prayers bounce off the ceiling and come back to you, that is not true. If your prayers come from inside and you're yearning and you're asking according to God's will, and if your prayers are spiritual, be certain that God is listening. The Lord listened to their prayers. They were tired and God listened. They were hungry and thirsty and God listened. They were depressed just like you and me sometimes. And God listened. And he delivered. Look at that powerful verse. The Canaanites over to them. Who gave them the Canaanites? God. God personally took it, his mission, to give this powerful enemy into the hands of his people. You know, sometimes people say, oh, Satan, very powerful. Sin, very strong. I cannot do it. This is a reminder that through God and with God, everything is possible. That is what God promises. If it is according to his will, these words show us that it is possible. It is possible to conquer the king of Arad. You may have that powerful king in your life today. I don't know what army is marching against you. I don't know what battle you're going through today. But with God, God promises victory. And indeed, they completely destroyed them and destroyed their towns. It's amazing how God can reverse a situation. Powerful army, weak army, these pray to God and all of a sudden the weak army becomes the powerful army and wins the situation. God can change things and he has changed things in your life. Look back in your life. Look back at a time when you thought it is impossible to happen. When you thought it is not doable and God said, no, it is doable. The world will tell us, no way. But the Bible says Yahweh. Yahweh is God's Hebrew name. They completely destroyed them. I often wondered and I read, why? Why did God want them to do that? Why when they, they said, okay, if you give that people to our hand, we will destroy them. I have spoken about this and I'll remind me and you again. Get rid of sin completely. Get rid of sin and its remnants and its traces and its memories and its ideas and thoughts in your life, in your heart, in your home, completely. Look at the words. They destroyed them completely. And that's what God expects from his people. 
God expects from us after we know him and we come to him to look back on sin and turn your back away, walk away, completely leave it, completely get rid of it. Don't leave traces of sin in your life. Don't leave reminders because one day they will evoke some feelings in you. They will get you stirred up. You may wonder, say, oh, that was a good time. Oh, I remember when I used to do this. Oh, I remember when she used to do that. I remember things. And that will stir ungodly thoughts and feelings in your heart. Why? Why leave it? Why do you still leave that link on your internet computer to that ungodly site? Why? You don't watch it. Just throw the computer, trash it away. Throw it. What's a couple of... Get rid of sin in our life completely. This is the first victory. Initially, they were defeated, but then they won. You know, sometimes God allows us to be defeated first. God sometimes allows his people to fall down, even to fall into sin. Even the great godly people, they fall into little sins. You know why? So we know that we're weak. So we depend on him. You know, if they fought with that army right away and they won, they say, who won? We did. We did it. We did it. We, we are the powerful. But God sometimes allows in our life to fall a little bit, to hurt a little bit, to bow down a little bit, even against sin. He allows it. He allows it. Otherwise, our hearts become what? Elevated and haughty. And we think we have done it on our own. I can tell you that King David's heart before and after sin completely different. His heart after he sinned with Beersheba is different. He saw God. He saw how ugly sin is. He saw the result of sin and what it caused to him and his family. And he became different. Victory. God offered his people victory today through this story. And God wants to tell you, I am ready to offer you victory to pray just like the people of Israel prayed. You can even take a vow. Take a vow to God. I want to get rid of this. I really want to. Help me. I am weak. I cannot do it. I've tried for a year and two and ten. And I've sought help from everyone. The whole system failed me. Only you, oh God. Only you can help me. And God would listen to a prayer like that. If that's what you really want. If that's what you really, really want to get over sin. Let's move on, if you will, to verse 10. Okay, let's look at the title. The journey to Moab. And I showed you where Moab is on that map. They are moving along the land up towards Canaan. We're moving north towards Canaan. The Israelites moved on. And then, certain, and then we see set out again. And then in verse 12, moved on they keep moving and in verse 13 another move they set out here i don't want to go into details of geography but the bible just simply tells us that the people of god are moving moving towards canaan the promised land they're moving towards it why is it that we're still still where we are i ask myself we don't move today my relationship with God is like yesterday, and it's like last month, and it's like last year, and it's even like the last five years. I still stumble with prayer. I still find it hard to fast. I still can't forgive. I still can't love. I still struggle with sin. The same thing. We're not moving. Why? Why are we not growing with our life and knowing of God? Why is it that we're stumbling? Why is it the people of God ought to be moving towards their promised land and I am not? Something is wrong. You see, if you seek a doctor and he gives you a treatment and you're not improving, something is wrong. You go back and you say, something is wrong. I am not, this is not the right medication. I'm not taking it the right way. I'm not taking it the way I should. Something is not right. If that is your case, if you think that today you and your family still at the same stage, like five years ago, Habibi, something is not right. Something is not right. You have to ask yourself, 
Why am I not growing? Why am I stunned? Why is my family not growing? Why? I asked that about myself, Miriam, the three children. Why is it we need to look deeper? When Peter looked to Christ and said, we can't find fish, Christ told him what? Go to the depth. Go inside. Go inside. Maybe we need to go inside to move on. And then look at verse 13. The Arnon. Do you see that? The Arnon. See, just before four, verse 14. The Arnon. I just want people to know what that is. That is a river. It is a branch from the Jordan. The Arnon River is the north border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. So just, just the geography part. But they're moving. They are moving. And we too need to. 14. Moses writes this, that is why the book of the wars of the Lord says, and then they write some names of locations and ravines and, and rivers and slopes and borders. What is this book of the wars of God? And when I researched it, it turned out to be a popular book where it's kept in the tabernacle. And in it, people write, scribes write, the wars and the victories and the success of God's people. They just write it down, scribe it down so that it passes from generation to generation. And they were so godly that they called these wars not their wars, but they are the wars of God. And they titled the book, The Book of the Wars of God or of the Book of of the words of the Lord. It is a chronicle about the conquest that the people of God have made. Do you also do the same thing? When God grants you victory over something, when God grants you success in a test, in a job interview, over sin, move, improve yourself, go to a better place, do you write memoirs so that you remember them Satan uses our forgetfulness of how great God has been with us and puts fear of God in our heart and puts fear of, of people in our heart simply because we forget how great God was. If you remember how God delivered you month after month, year after year, do I don't know about you, but I remember very well when I came into this nation. I was, I don't know. I, was, I, was, I didn't have a degree, I didn't have a home, I didn't have money, I didn't have food. I didn't, it was, everything was very, very low and poor. God put great friends in my life, great family, great church, and slowly he held my hand and lifted me up. And I always like to go back to then so that you don't get haughty. You don't think very highly of yourself, but you remember where you were and how you were. Not only will you give God his, his, his glory, you will also have compassions on people who are like that today. Because you were like that one day. We were like that one day. Remember these times. Also the same thing. If God grants you success over a sin, over an ungodly relationship, over something wrong in your spiritual life, don't look bad onto people who are still struggling with it today. Actually reach out to them. Help them and encourage them and tell them that there is hope. That the chronicles are there. Remember the things that God has done in your life and share it with your family. Please, share it with your sisters, share it with your wife and your husband and your children on glorious days. You know, March break, Christmas, New Year's. New Year's, when you stand and pray with your family, say, oh God, we started this year with such and such and such, and look where we are today. You have been with us. Write down these chronicles in the hearts of your children so that they know what God has done to you. And as I preached and I teached last time, your children will be who you are. Again, your children will be who you are. If you fear God, they will grow fearing God. If you pray, they will grow to be prayerful people. If you come to church and love the church, this, if you are a grumbling nature, your kids will grumble. If you love money, your kids will be lovers of money. 
If you sit at home and be a couch potato and bum out and don't work, your kids will be like you. If you're hardworking, your kids will be like you. Verse 16. From there, they continued on to beer. And maybe I didn't show you on the map. I'm sorry where that beer is. There is so many, three or four beers. And it's not a Hanukkah. This is not what the Bible intends. A beer in Egyptian, by the way, is a well. It is a well. It's in Hebrew, also beer. And they call it beer, beer larahoi. There's many beers, but beer is another word for well that brings out water. From there, they continued on to beer. The well where, <coughs> listen with me, the Lord said to Moses, gather the people and I will give them water. I, I read this verse and I loved it. God said to Moses, the leader, gather the people. Jesus used a similar phrase in his life when he said, Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how many times I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks under its wings, but you refused. And today, today, God, I think, has the same cry. I want to gather all the people under one title. All are Christians. We are divided. You like it or not. You want to be politically correct or not. We are divided. The Orthodox, the Protestant, the Catholic, the, the I don't know who and I don't know what. And even in Orthodoxy there's divisions. and We are divided. God's heart is to bring us all together so that we can all drink from the same water. And that well, that water is Christ, is the symbol of the living water. This is his desire to call Moses, the leader, the big leader who it is. I don't know who the leaders are today. Gather the people and you will not. It is, he says, I will give them the water. God wants to give the water. He wants to provide. He wants to give the people all together. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. And that's, I love this theme of SMSV that we want to be all one. All one. Everybody like the other. Verse 17, after the people drank, what do you expect them to say? They'll be happy. They'll be joy. They will be satisfied. When you drink of Jesus, when you taste him, when you see the spring of living water coming in, if you really have a relationship with Christ, you will be joyful and happy. You cannot keep and contain it inside of you. You know why I say this? Because I was like that. I was lost. I was thirsty. I was... I don't want to tell you much, otherwise your impression of me will change. But I know what it is to live in darkness. I know what it is to be outside in the cold. I know. I know. I know how pleasurable sin can be. I know what the world can offer. I know. But when I drank from the living water, I knew it was different. I knew it was different, just like the wedding of Cana of Galilee, when the guests and the, and the honor said, you know, people give the good wine first, and then bring, but you brought the good wine. I knew that this was the good wine. This is the life. This is the truth. This is the salvation. This is the victory. And they sang for joy, and they said their song, spring up, oh well, sing about it, and sing. So they were happy. Basically, they were happy. I want to move to verse 21, my beloved. Remember this title? Look at this title, Sihon. I showed you where that was on the map, just north of the Moabs. And the king of Og. These are two kings or two locations with their kings. And they want to pass through them, just like they want to pass through Edom. Remember Moses wrote them a letter to say, please let us pass. And they said, no. And what did Moses do? Because it was his brother, he chose not to fight. And we talked about brothers fighting. I'm not going to repeat it. 
let's see how Israel responds this time to these people. Israel sent messengers to the king of Sihon, the Amorite. We saw where the Amorites were in that land. <laughs> Sihon is a symbol of Satan. There's a few people that symbolize Satan. This man is like one of them. Babylon and the king of Babylon is also a symbol of Satan. Every time you read about Babylon, think of Satan. This is the same thing with this people, the people of Sihon and Og. And he was a king, and Satan is a king. And Christ said Satan is a king. He said he is the prince of this world, or the prince of the air. And really, I didn't understand it until I saw the internet and how the prince of the air can manipulate it to mess up the minds of people. Israel sent the messengers to this king and they said, let us pass through your country. Look at the politeness, decency. I write letters every, every day in my work, letters to specialists. You know, use decent language, decent. I have seen people who are undecent in the way they talk and the way they request and in the way they speak. Let us make sure that we are decent with one another. Do you know how to be decent? Is that word familiar to you? Decent? Teach our children to be decent people who know how to do good. Do good, not bad. Goodness, decency, politeness. These are ethical things, worldly things. I'm not saying spiritual things, just be polite. You know, when you see a senior in the bus, stand up. Let them sit down. When you see a pregnant woman, just give her your chair. You, this is called decency, common sense, etiquette, politeness. It is missing from today's generation. Let us pass through your country. Look at the decency. We will not turn aside. We will not go into any field, any vineyard. We will not drink any water. We will travel along the king's highway. And last time we spoke about this king's highway. The highway... It was a traffic highway like the 404 today. But to us as Christians, we also have our own highway. We have our king's highway. Given and transcribed and patterned and painted and drawn for us by Christ. Follow this is the king's highway. But in verse 23 we read, Sihon hmm, would not let Israel pass. He said no. And not only that, see that's how Satan does. He stumbles you in your walk to Canaan and he musters an enemy and wants you to fall in sin and trap you and trip you down and defeat you. And he came into the desert against Israel. Please remember, it is important to repeat this. Satan is out there like a lion wanting to devour us and stumble us. And every time you make a step progress, he makes 10 steps towards you. But Jesus said that what who is greater than me than in the world, we will have possession of the land and we will be victorious on God's side. If God is with us, who can be against us? And look here, and when they fought, verse 24 tells us, that Israel put him to the sword. They won because they drank from the water. They were joyful. King David says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Israel put him to the sword. Whenever you read about swords in the Bible, remember the Bible. Do you know that the word of God is likened to a sharp sword in the Bible? The book of Ephesians also talks about the armor of God. One of that is a sword. The sword which is the word of God. You can fight Satan with the word of God. Habibi, I want to tell you that you can change your life with the word of God. I know of a man who was married and was in an ungodly relationship. And the word of God turned him. He was going out to meet that girl behind his wife. 
when he stumbled upon a verse from the Bible as he was tying his shoelace. And the verse said that if you are going out with a woman in an ungodly relationship, you are like a deer going into the snooze. You're like you're going into your cage. You are like a bird that is going to be pierced by an arrow. And he thought about this and he changed and he changed. And I know this man today is different. The word of God is alive and it can change people. That's why Hosanna's motto is study God's word. Number two, love it. And number three, live it. You have to live it. You have to live it. Israel captured, look at verse 25, captured all the cities of the Amorites and they occupied them. They were victorious. When was the last time you were victorious in your spiritual war? Can you share with us? Can you think of a time this year when God gave you victory over something? Spiritual victory. Spiritual victory. Someone you couldn't love, you were able to love. Someone you couldn't have a good relationship with, and you amend that. Someone who has hated you and you were able to forgive them. Someone asked you for help and you were able to reach down into your pocket and give them. Sometimes that too is hard. And verse 31, quickly. So Israel settled in the land of the Amorites. I just want to tell you in verse 33 that another king... Look at verse 33. Then they turned and went up along the road towards Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, this is the other symbol of Satan. His whole army came out to meet them in battle. You see, they didn't want to fight. They were just walking, minding their own business. But this Og came against them. In a battle, an unprovoked battle. One army attacking one army for no real reason. Have you experienced that in your life? That some man, some individual will come and attack you, attack your family for no reason. Somebody at your workplace, a neighbor, a family member, somebody at the church for no reason. Or they may be one. Maybe they're jealous of you. Maybe they're afraid of you. Maybe they don't want you to be better than them. Maybe they heard of your fame and they're not happy. And they come and slander you, slander your family, slander your... People today still attack one another for similar reasons. Verse 34, the Lord said to Moses not to be afraid of him. When the people of God prayed to God, God answered and he told them, do not be afraid of him for I have delivered him into your hands. That was the promise of God. And before we finish, I will show you those two or three pictures and they are really meaningful. This is, what is that? That is the bronze snake and I'll just read you the text people traveled again from Mount Hur and they went around Edom but the people grew impatient and they started to talk about God and we said that when you complain against the people of God you're actually complaining against God grumbling please don't be grumbling person You know, if you start to grumble once, the next day you'll grumble twice, the third day you'll grumble three times, and the fourth day your wife will start grumbling, and the fifth day your children will be grumbling, and your whole family is going to be, a gr it is infectious. Stay away from grumbling people. And if you are the grumbling kind, please look at others who are less fortunate than we are. Believe me, we, we, there's no reason. Don't grumble. No need to grumble. Don't complain about your situation. Why don't you come with me tomorrow rounding on my surgical floor? I will show you real people in real bad situations. 
with their guts coming out of them, with their cancers everywhere. They're in pain. They can't eat. They can't drink. They can't walk. They can't shower. They have. I can show you people, and they are thankful. And we grumble. No. No, Habib, don't do it. Don't do it. Be thankful, and don't be like the people, those stiff-necked people. They grumbled. They grumbled against God and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt? You want us to die in the desert? We don't have no water. We don't have no bread. And the sad thing is they say, and we detest this miserable food. What are they talking about? The manna. The manna. They're talking about the manna. Sometimes we also detest the food we have. Many people detest the food we have, this food. They say, why, why, why is that necessary? Why this and why that? But as you know, God sent venomous snakes to bite them. The Bible says, listen to me, they bit the people. And the Israelite people started to die. These burning, fiery snakes started to beat the people before God was tolerant but this time he wasn't he said that the snakes and he wanted to discipline his people you know sometimes God is tolerant with us but at other times no he will say I'm not I've I've shown you my favor I've shown you my grace and I am not going to tolerate this abuse and he disciplines you with a problem another picture and you all know this the people came to Moses. Okay, that's a very good start. When you are in pain, when you are suffering, come to a leader, come to the pastor, come to the great pastor, Christ. They knew who to go to. They came to Moses and they said, we sinned. And this is important. It's important that they learn their lesson. Sadly, after some of them died. Sadly, after they saw this, the bronze snake, and they said, we sinned against you and against God. <coughs> and they were beautiful when they said, pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. You know what? If I was Moses, I will say, mm -mm. you people, <laughs> you grumble. I am really, ha I wish these snakes will kill you all. I want them to bite you and destroy you. And I want to get rid of you. You've given me a headache for 40 years. But we read here, unbelievable. So Moses prayed for the people. I love this guy, Moses. I learned from him how to be tolerant. Even to people who abuse him. He still prayed for them. Can you do that? Do you pray for your family? I'm not saying pray for your enemies. Pray for your family. Your children have exams every night. You hold the children's hand with your spouse and you stand before the Lord and say, Lord, we give in to you tomorrow's exam. And in my household, we assign a saint to that particular subject. And we thank God and the saint after the children do well in the exam. Your children will be who you are. The Lord said to Moses, I would have expected, okay, Moses, I will take the snakes. But no, God told Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole, like you see up there. And anyone who is bitten and they look at it, they will live. This, and Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake, so the Son of Man will be lifted up really really this picture is true the snake and christ the same if you are bitten with sin you look to christ you will receive salvation i want to tell you that moses was surprised and i said that you know why moses said don't do idols for yourself but here we see that God is telling Moses, oh, make an idol. Moses must have been very surprised. And when he told him, use a snake, Moses was shocked. A snake, this is something detested. A snake is a symbol of death. You know, when you talk to anyone about snakes, they remember Adam and Eve and the serpent. It's a bad story. It's a story of sin. 
But yet God used this. Sometimes God wants us to change the way we think, to transform our thoughts. You may think and Moses may think that this is detestable, putting a snake, an ugly snake. I want to tell you that today people think that a naked man on a piece of wood is also absurd. It is detestable. It is something repulsive. Why are you guys worshiping a naked man on a cross? It's terrible. Why do you do it? And people keep refusing to accept that. Well, it is your problem. People, if you thought that that snake was detestable and you didn't look to it, you would have died in your sins. You know, the Apostle Paul says, Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. What is this? This is a medical symbol. Pharmacists will know this very well. Where does this come from? Pharmacists and doctors realize that this is, you put that on your prescription, you put that in the hospital, you put that in the office, this logo of the serpent and sort of a bronze thing is more or less the same as the serpent that we see in front of us. Please take time to look. Take time to look on the cross. Do you have a cross at home? Put that in your worship center. I hope we all have worship centers. Put that as a worship center. Put that in your cross. And look at it. Look at it. Look at it, especially if you're in pain. When I look to the cross, I remember two things. Number one, pain. Pain and suffering is important. The church fathers say that if you run from trials and tribulations and pain, you're running from God. Maybe that's why God wanted to put this symbol of pain and suffering before us. And number two, I remember death because these Christ died on the cross. I remember me too. One day I'm going to meet him. I'm going to die. We hate to say the word, but it is a reality. It is a reality. And I love the part in the Agbeah when we pray and say, Oh, Saint Mary, come to us at the time when we depart and rescue us from the gates of Hades. Because some people, when they die, they will go to Hades. And some people, when they die, they will go to paradise. They will be received by the angels. Don't you expect angels to come? Angels to be around at the time of your departure. Today, we we'll learned about victories of the people of God. And my prayer is that you too, my beloved, will be Victorious. Hosanna Bible Study Groom meets every Friday, 7.30 p.m. till 9.30 p.m. at SMSV Church, 3300 Highway 7 East Markham. The website is hosannabiblestudy.com where you can sign up for weekly emails and you will get emails about upcoming lecture and the questions and everything else.